Hi, everybody. How's it going? Hello. <laughs> Welcome to Benazair. Thank you guys for coming tonight. My name is Dr. Michael Bruce. I am the sleep guy here at Benazair. And I wanted to introduce myself to you and also just kind of give you a little bit more information about sleep. I know we're kind of going through a little bit of a crazy time right now for a lot of people out there and a lot of people aren't sleeping like they used to, right? And so the goal here tonight is to answer any questions that you might have, not only just about the services that we're going to have here, but also about sleep in general. Um, and then specific to COVID, that's fine. The only thing I don't do is I don't do dream interpretation. All right, I'm just letting you know now. It's not really, it's not really my area of specialty for sure. So what I thought I'd do is start out with just a couple of minutes on basic sleep science so everybody has the same language. And then we'll go into a whole bunch of more practical tips, things that you can actually use literally starting tonight or tomorrow that can help you get a better night's rest. Feel free to raise hands and ask questions. We have some note cards here if you're shy. So if people want, we can pass these around. Um, if you have questions, you can write them down and shoot them up my way, or you can just blurt them out. I haven't had a question yet that I haven't been able to answer, but there is a first for sure. So most people don't know this, but the way that sleep actually works in the brain is with two specific systems. One is called your sleep drive. The other is called your sleep rhythm. Okay, so let's talk about drive first. So drive turns out to be a ton like hunger. Right? So I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. I eat something and that hunger begins to dissipate. It turns out that the same holds true with sleep. So when a cell eats a piece of glucose, one of the things that comes out the back end is this stuff called adenosine. Adenosine works its way through the system. It goes to a very specific receptor site in your brain. As adenosine accumulates, you get sleepier and sleepier and sleepier. Now to be fair, I'm a little bit of a sleep geek. And so I was looking at the molecular structure of adenosine and I was looking at molecular structure of a couple of different things and I noticed that the molecular structure of adenosine and the molecular structure of caffeine is different by one molecule. Kind of interesting that the thing that makes you fall asleep versus the thing that stimulates you is literally off by one molecule. But the thing that was more interesting is when you look at the receptor sites where adenosine can fit in, caffeine fits in there perfectly as well. That little piece of information is going to become important in about four minutes. So once we understand how sleep drive works, right, this accumulation of adenosine, that's the drive side. The rhythm side turns out to be also a lot like hunger. So you ever notice that you're hungry around breakfast time, around lunch time, around dinner time? That's your circadian rhythm. That's your body's telling you, hey, these are the times that I want to eat. Same holds true with sleep. Most people, at least here in North America, have a tendency to get sleepy somewhere around 10 to 11, 11.30 at night. Now, there's one big caveat with all of that idea, which is people have these things called chronotypes. Now, you might not have heard of the term chronotype, but I guarantee you, you've heard of the concept. Has anybody ever called you an early bird or a night owl? This is the part where people shake their heads, raise their hands, and participate. How many people in the room have been called a night owl before? Oh, my brethren, thank you. How many people have been called an early bird? Uh, oh, so we, and anybody? In the middle? Perfect. So it turns out that there aren't just two chronotypes, and there's not even just three chronotypes. So my contribution to the literature, uh, my most recent book was called The Power of When, and I discovered a fourth chronotype. It turns out that there's a specific form of insomnia that's very consistent with a very particular circadian rhythm. So once you kind of know what your chronotype is, hmm, what can you do with that piece of information? So I'm going to tell you what happened with me when I learned what my chronotype was and happened to my sleep. So just to be clear, I don't have a sleep problem, I don't suffer from sleep problem, that wasn't why I got into this. Um, but I started looking at my chronotypical bedtime. So I'm a night owl, and it made the most sense for me to go to bed around midnight. And I would wake up without an alarm around 7.30. Over the course of time, making my wake up time incredibly consistent, wake up time, not bedtime, wake up time incredibly consistent of 7.30, all of a sudden, I started naturally waking up at 7.15. Still going to bed at midnight, 7.15. About three, four months later, it naturally is waking up at seven o'clock. I'm consolidating my sleep schedule all of a sudden. It kept going. So I'm the sleep doctor and I go to bed around midnight and I wake up around 6.15 every day. I get about six hours and 15 minutes of sleep. I don't drink a tremendous amount of caffeine and I have this level of energy almost all day. 
Michael, how on earth can you be the sleep doctor and be sleeping only six hours and 15 minutes? So what, we, what I've done is I've created a program where we do high performance sleep coaching. And so what does that mean? So when I have athletes, when I have CEOs, when I have people come to me and they say, you know, Michael, I know I need eight, I only have time for six. Can I do that in a healthy way? The answer is actually yes. Right? And so when we start to look at these consolidating sleep schedules, it gets really interesting, really quickly. People end up having a lot more time. And then, so then you start to look at it and you say, well, what about the stages of sleep? Are they missing out on certain stages by not having enough? So let's talk about stages for just a second. So it turns out there are cycles of sleep. You go from wake to stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, back to stage two, and then to REM sleep. Does anybody in here remember the band called REM? Yes. That's the point everybody's supposed to participate. Okay, we're working on this, we're working on this. So when you look at the stages of sleep, right, what's a cycle? A cycle is from wake to REM. That little dance maneuver, which by the way, you have to follow almost exactly in that way, takes approximately 90 minutes. Right? That's going to be important for you to remember in a little while. The average human has five of these sleep cycles a night. Five sleep cycles, 90 minutes apiece. Five times 90 is? 450. Come on, I didn't tell you there's going to be math. I know I'm throwing you off. 450 minutes divided by 60 is seven and a half hours. The math doesn't even work. Who came up with eight hours of sleep? Right? So you start to think about that. Who came up with eight hours of sleep? So it was actually originally a study done at Stanford where they locked people in a, one of those temperature controlled, environmentally controlled chambers and then left them in there for 30 days. I mean, they fed them and they had a bathroom and all that kind of good stuff. What they discovered was after 30 days, their bodies wouldn't allow them to sleep longer than eight hours and 13 minutes. And there was actually a plus or minus of that 13 minutes. So that's where the recommendation of eight hours came from. A study that was done at Stanford in the 20s, I think. Right. So the entire universe is functioning off of this idea that I gotta get eight hours of sleep. Yet here I am, I'm a sleep specialist, I've been dedicated my life to this, and I'm sleeping from midnight to 6.15. I think I'm doing pretty good, right? So again, we're starting to talk about different ideas and different ways to think about sleep. What do the stages do for me, and, what are they, and how are they useful? Stages three and four sleep is the money sleep. That's where the largest bolus of growth hormone is emitted. So that is the physical restoration that you see from sleep, right? That is the wake up and feel great sleep. By the way, alcohol destroys stage three four sleep. We'll talk about that in just a second. Let's move on to REM sleep. REM sleep is pretty interesting. What's, what's REM sleep most known for? Dreams. Dreams, that's correct. Turns out you can dream in any stage of sleep, but you're 80% likely if you're waking up in the stage of REM to be having a dream. What is REM sleep really good for? So it turns out that REM sleep is really good for moving information from our short-term memory to our long-term memory, right? It's a very interesting process. During stages three and four, we have a filter that filters out data that we don't want. Just remember, we've been collecting data all day, right? Through our eyes, through our ears, through our mouth, through our nose. Our brain's gonna wanna do something with that data. Stage three, four filters out what we don't want and moves what we do want into REM. REM then has to find an organizational substructure inside our head to store the data. It's kind of like finding the right filing cabinet, finding the right file drawer, and finding the right file to put your data in. Here's the problem. Thousands of pieces of information are wandering into your brain on a pretty regular basis. So sometimes your brain doesn't get it right. So the bizarre nature of your dreams is more than likely, well, your brain might not have gotten the right folder for the right piece of information. So if you walk downstairs in your dream and your dog is having a bowl of spaghetti at your kitchen table with your second grade teacher and you're wondering what the heck is going on here, more than likely what happened is you had Italian for dinner, your dog jumped on your bed in the middle of the night, your second grader was talking about a school assignment which reminded you of your second grade teacher. And that's how it works. That's kind of how dreams work, right? Dreams have a very bizarre nature to them. There's not a lot we know about dreams still. But what we think from a dream theory perspective is this is where we're moving through our emotions in one way or another. We're playing things out in our head because it's a safe environment in which to do that. And the dream has a tendency to feel incredibly lifelike and real. Now, one of the things that's important to know about dreams and REM sleep in particular is that you're completely paralyzed during REM sleep. Anybody want to take a guess as to why? Exactly right. You get the gold star. So, 
what happens, the reason we're paralyzed during REM sleep is so that we don't act out our dreams. So I'm going to digress for a second. I'm going to tell you about a patient that I have. So I treated a patient who had something called REM behavior disorder. So REM behavior disorder is where you do act out your dreams. So this is back when I was living uh, in Sandy Springs, Georgia. And I, this gentleman came in and he was a hunter. And if you're a hunter, you know that if you shoot a doe and you don't kill it, you either need to slit its throat or crack its neck. It's the most humane thing to do. He woke up with his wife's head ready to crack her neck. You can't make this stuff up, guys. Right? So what's the first question? Come on, what's the first question? Was it the wife that pulled him in? <laughs> That's not usually the first question. Did he kill her? Right? I mean, come on, guys. We're in healthcare. We're supposed to be compassionate people. Like, did he kill her? No, no, no uh, humans were killed for the telling of this story, for sure. Second question. What's the most popular second question? Are they still married? That's the right. That is the most popular <laughs> second question. She is a patient woman. I'll tell you that right now. But here's what we discovered was we used the appropriate protocol, which is actually clonazepam. Clonazepam, 0.25 milligrams, kept him in one place at one time. Safety issues were all gone. He stayed in bed. It was perfect. Here's what's fascinating about REM behavior disorder. In 35% of the cases, it's a precursor for Parkinson's. Guess what? We actually identified it 10 years before we saw any major Parkinsonian types of symptomatology based on some of the things that we saw that were going on in his REM sleep. The reason I tell the story is because sleep is a window into your health. It could be your mental health, it could be your physical health. But if you're not sleeping well, something in this unit isn't working right. And it's usually more than one thing, right? So now let's get to the practical part. So what can we do with all this information, Michael, that you've now taught? Well, the first thing we can do is figure out what your bedtime should be, right? When was the last time somebody told you to go to bed? Like six, eight, ten years old, something like that? So what we should do is we should take our socially determined wake-up time. So what does that mean? In our house, it's what time does the dog want to get up, right, <laughs> to go take the dog for a walk. So let's pick an easy time. Let's say 6.30, right? How many cycles? Five. How long are they? Five times 90, one more time? Seven and a half hours, 450 minutes, that's correct. So we take our socially determined wake up time and we count backwards. So if we wake up at 6.30, now we know what our bedtime is, it's 11 o'clock. It's literally that simple. If you get one thing from my lecture tonight, if you wake up at the same time every single day, including the weekends, which I know sucks, what will happen is you will see a massive consolidation of your sleep. Everything works better once your circadian rhythm is honored. So if you know what your circadian rhythm is, maybe you're an early bird, maybe you're a night owl, maybe you're an insomniac. Once you figure that part out, everything gets easier because your body is doing what it wants to do. It's sleeping during the time period that your body hormonally is asking it to do so. That's when everything starts to work a whole lot better. So, now that we know how to go to bed and when to wake up, what are a couple of different things that we should do during the day? Like, Michael, how should we wake up and feel refreshed and ready to meet the day? So let me tell you exactly what you should do. So how many people here, by the way, the first liquid that passes over their lips in the morning Coffee. is caffeinated? <laughs> Raise your hands. Okay, so, so let's talk about this. So in order to pull the brain out of a state of unconsciousness, you need two hormones, okay? You need adrenaline and cortisol, they both have to be pretty high, right? So what happens when you wake up in the morning? You have an adrenalized and a cortisolized, I don't even know if that's a word, brain, right? When you add caffeine to that, it does almost nothing. But here's the secret. If you wait 90 minutes after you wake up, both cortisol and adrenaline begin a natural drop. If you add caffeine at that point, it actually helps drop the cortisol, I'm sorry, drop the adrenaline, lift the cortisol up to get a bigger bang. What should you be drinking in the morning? Water. 18 to 20 ounces of water. Most people don't know this. Sleep in and of itself is a dehydrative event. You, you lose almost a full liter of water every night from the humidity in your breath, right? So when you wake up, do you really want to take a diuretic? Because that's what caffeine is, right? So thinking through this idea, you want to hydrate the body. You want to get the body up and energized and going. So number one, when you wake up, Please don't drink any coffee, or at least wait 90 minutes. Grab a bottle of water or a, uh, what is it, a reusable cup, because we're not supposed to use bottles of water anymore by your bedside. 
and drink the whole thing. What should you be doing at, while or after you drink the whole thing? Sunlight. Michael, you're saying such easy things. What, what are you talking about here? Sunlight. So it turns out that when sunlight hits your eye, you have a special cell in your eye called the melanopsin cell. And it turns off the melatonin faucet in your brain. How many people in here have brain fog in the morning when they wake up? Hmm? Guess why? Your melatonin is still going. It's one of the main reasons why people experience that if you're waking up not inside your chronotype. So what can you do to avoid that? Get some sun. Right? So what do I have people do? Grab your water, walk over to the window, or walk outside and get 15 minutes of fresh sunlight. Do me a favor, put on a robe. I'm just saying, right? You just got out of bed, right? You got your glass of water. Put on, no, the neighbors don't want to see that. But that is absolutely positively what you should be doing. You should also be doing some type of breathing while you're out there. So Lauren thinks I'm crazy, but in the mornings I walk outside with our dog in our little postage stamp of a backyard and he's running around and I've been drinking my water and I'm getting my sunlight and I just do a couple of big deep breaths and you know what? I take my shoes off and I put my feet on the earth and I don't know exactly why <laughs> and that's what I do in the mornings, right? It's about what is my morning ritual? You notice there was no caffeine involved in there and lots of energy in the morning. I'm walking my dog. I mean, all the things that I really want to be able to do, I can easily do in the morning with just a few simple steps. Other things that we can do at night to think about how we can affect our sleep. Let's talk about the biggest culprit out there, which is alcohol, right? There's a really big difference between going to sleep and passing out. Okay, right? The closer you drink alcohol to the time that you're closing your eyes, the more destruction it does to your system in terms of deep sleep, right? So here's the general rubric in which I work. If you have one glass of wine, drink one glass of water, wait one hour before it lights out. Two, two, two. Here's what's interesting when you get to three glasses of wine, beer, spirits, or whatever. Alcohol does something a little bit different in your body. It doesn't make you calm down. For guys, when they hit the third drink, many of them become aggressive. I can't think of anything worse right before bed than being aggressive <laughs> or being jacked up. So if you can limit your alcohol intake and play the timing right, you can enjoy your adult beverage and still get a great night's sleep. Exercise turns out to be another massively important factor for sleep quality, because that's kind of what we're talking about here is sleep quality. So the data is incredibly consistent. When people are regular exercisers, they have a significantly, I think it's almost 25% increase in their overall sleep quality. What kind of exercise? It should be cardio, it should be for at least 20 minutes a day. It doesn't look like you have to run a marathon or something like that, but it has to be daily. That's where we really see the biggest benefit. So one of the things people have been asking me a lot about during COVID, I've been doing a lot of medium things like that, it's like, why is everybody's sleep schedule so off? I'll tell you exactly why, nobody's moving. We sleep to recover. If we're not doing anything that our body needs to recover from, we're not gonna, have, we're not gonna be seeing the levels of sleep and the depth of sleep that we're looking for. So one of my big prescriptions is movement, right? Got it right here, right? But in, in, in Los Angeles, what do I do? If, I'm, if I don't have the ability to go here, I'm doing a 20 minute cardio workout in my house with my dog at 7.15 in the morning, <laughs> right? And it doesn't have to be big, right? I was telling, where's TJ? So I was, talking with, I was working with TJ this morning, who, by the way, is amazing. I've actually now worked with almost every single person in here, and I can tell you I've actually done all of the services, by the way, and I think I did them all today. Yeah. Right? I think I did, like, literally, I had a spa day today, by the way, and it was amazing. I'm going to sleep like a stone. You had chef's cookie, even. I know, I know. I've got the whole crew. It's amazing. Um, so when we're talking about exercise, 20 minutes a day, you don't have to be big, but you want to do it daily. What about close to bedtime, Michael? Should I exercise close to bed? Should I not exercise close to bed? You want to give yourself about a four hour distance from sleeping. Why? It turns out that the sleep rhythm follows your core body temperature rhythm. So as your core body temperature must drop in order for your brain to release melatonin, if you jacked it up by exercising too close to bedtime, it has a hard time dropping. Now there is kind of an interesting method that people use who have insomnia, where they artificially increase their core body temperature in order to recreate that core body temperature drop. It's called a bubble bath. What are you talking about, Michael? 90 minutes before bed, I have patients who can't fall asleep. We put them into, it has to be a bubble bath. Why does it have to be a bubble bath? Because when you put the bubbles across the top of the water, it forms a layer of insulation that keeps the water hotter longer. So what we want to do is get you submerged to your neck in about 100 degree water. 99 is fine. 
Move that core body temperature up a little bit, stay in there for a good 15, 20 minutes, get out, within 90 minutes you'll go to bed, and what you have is this artificial core body temperature drop that plays out nicely. Add a little lavender or a little Epsom salt, relax, throw in a bed partner, whatever you want to do, I don't care, but if you want to relax before bed, it's probably not the worst thing. Okay? A couple other things that we can think about when we're talking about this. What do you do right before bed? Well, here's the thing. I'm the only sleep doctor literally in the universe that says it's okay to fall asleep with the television on. <laughs> what? <laughs> what a heresy, total heresy, Dr. Bruce. What are you thinking about here? So here's the truth of the matter is, when you look at television before bed, it's not bad. It's a distraction technique. So we were talking earlier about people, and what do they do before bed? They ruminate. They're, they can't turn off the brain. By the way, number one complaint I get in my office is I can't turn off my brain from trying to fall asleep. And I'm going to show you something really cool in just a second. But one of the things that we've got to do is we've got to avoid that ruminative thought. How do you do that? Distraction is arguably one of the best ways to do that. Television is an easy distraction, guys. 99% of the televisions are built with a timer inside the software. Set the timer for three hours after you're planning on going to sleep and it can turn off and you will be fine. If you want to know what the data is, I'll tell you, there's none. There's no data. Nobody's ever run a study saying, if you watch television before bed, what's going to happen to your sleep? There have been plenty of studies that said if there's light on in the room, if there's, but nobody's ever kind of said, what is TV and how does it really have an effect? So here's what I can tell you. 95% of my patients who have some issues with sleep more than likely fall asleep with the television on. Me just giving them permission to actually save more uh, sleepless nights, I think, than just about anything else. But again, there's very little data, if any, to suggest that that's a bad idea. It turns out that that's actually a pretty good idea. Um, if you're going to watch TV, what about the blue light, Michael? I mean, I, I keep seeing all these articles. Blue light is bad. It's going to change my circadian rhythm. Try blue light walking glasses. We'll have them here. I actually have my own line of them um, because I didn't like what was being created. But these are amber glasses that can be used. They're very effective. Um, they just block out the blue. You can still see the TV, you can still read, you can still use your e-reader and all those kind of different things. <coughs> E-readers, people ask me about those all the time. They say, well, what about my phone? I got that night shift thing on my phone. They did a study at uh, RPI, absolutely ineffective. There's no effectiveness of the night shift at, at all. You need lenses. Now here's what's also interesting is we're seeing a commoditization of blue light blocking glasses. If you go on Amazon, they're like 18 bucks, 19 bucks, and you'll see that they're clear. Turns out there's three different factors in when a light affects your eye. One is the color, blue light in particular. The second is the brightness, that's why you have the amber. And the third is the angle. Nobody's talking about the angle and everybody's trying to avoid the brightness because nobody likes the lens being an orange color. So when you have patients or if you're out there consumer buying, you don't want the clear lenses. They really don't work. So they don't have that level of effectiveness. A couple other things that I oftentimes like to talk to people about before bed is, remember, sleep is not an on-off switch. It's more like slowly pulling your foot off the gas and slowly putting your foot on the brake. You've got to give yourself some runway to land the plane. How do you want to do that is really up to you. What I tell people all the time is take the last 30 to 60 minutes of the night, chop it up. So let's say 30 minutes of the night, 10 minutes for just the stuff you got to do, 10 minutes for hygiene, and then 10 minutes for some form of meditation, relaxation, prayer, whatever gets you there, right? That's where you want to be. Sleep is a process. It is a natural process. I tell people all the time, sleep is exactly like love. The less you look for it, the more it shows up, right? When you try and try and try to sleep, the level of autonomic arousal is intense and you can't get it. Little known fact, in order to enter into a state of unconsciousness, your heart rate needs to be at 60 or below. It's really that simple. If you or your patients can get them to a heart rate of 60 or below, then the sleep process has the ability to kick in. We were talking about cooling just a second, but I want to show you guys this really interesting piece of technology that you were interested in earlier. So I work with lots of different com companies um, on new medical technology and things like this. So this is the newest, latest, greatest one, and I'm gonna be very straight up with you. I really didn't think it was gonna work. I was really surprised with the results that I got. So uh, about 10 years ago, maybe, maybe longer, Dr. Eric Knopfsinger 
was interested in ruminative thought, right? So that can't turn off my brain before bed thinking. So he did an MRI on patients while they were having this issue. And what he discovered was there's a tremendous amount of cerebral blood flow in the frontal cortex. And he was like, well, maybe that's what's causing this ruminative thought. So I just want to slow down the blood flow. Well, it's not so easy thing to do. So he decided to try using temperature. And what he discovered was at particular cold temperatures, you can slow blood flow. And guess what it does? People report that their thinking starts to slow down and they're able to fall asleep. So I said, this sounds ridiculous. I've never heard of something this ridiculous. There's no way something like this could work. And I've read all of Eric's studies. And to be clear, he's an amazing scientist. His, his stuff goes into some of the top medical journals in the world. But I was really kind of concerned at something like this. Um, to be clear, I've had this for about three weeks. I've worn it almost every night. I would prefer if I never sleep without it. My sleep has been so much better from a qualitative standpoint. And again, that's not what it, this was designed to do, but as you can probably tell, I have a lot of energy. I kind of have a little bit of anxiety. Like, these things are issues for me. This really helped me do it. I'm gonna pass it around so people can see it, but I'm gonna turn it on so that way you can feel how cold it gets. But it's kind of interesting. These, there's three pads here, and you'll, you can just put your hand on it and you'll be able to feel it. It gets pretty cold. This remote is the power source. So you're wondering, okay, Michael, are you going to get wound up in the cord and something like that? No, not at all. So what's interesting about this is that this was very helpful. Again, new technology. We're probably going to be offering these here uh, for patients and for physicians if they want to try them out and, and see how they do. Um, these, are def these are definitely pretty interesting from a technology standpoint. And another interesting piece of new technology um, are home-based sleep studies. Now, there's not a whole lot that's new about home-based sleep studies out there, but one of the things that we'll be doing is for everybody that's coming through, even if they're on the sleep disorder side, not necessarily, I mean on the disordered sleep side, not on the sleep disorder side, we're gonna probably be screening them with overnight sleep studies. So these are apnea tests primarily. And so again, we want to screen people out because if you've got active apnea, I want to get you treated by somebody in the community here, have you get your CPAP or your dental appliance or your surgical intervention and do your thing. That's not what we want to do here. But what we want to do here is support that as well as look at other aspects of your sleep that could be important like magnesium deficiencies, uh, vitamin D deficiencies, these types of things. So we'll be doing screenings with these uh, home-based sleep studies. And they're actually super simple. So this is a strap that actually goes around the chest. The patient will have a cannula that will come here. It'll be straight up oxygen cannula. And then there's just a pulse ox. That's it. It's really convenient. It's super simple. Patients can sleep with it and they don't complain. It collects data for 24 hours. We'll give it to them. They'll bring it back. We'll score it here. And they'll be able to say, hey, look, if you, we, there's a high, high likelihood based on this home sleep test you got sleep apnea. Let's send you out to the community, get that treated, and then bring you back in, and then continue on your approach. So these are some of the things that we're going to be offering uh, that I think people will find quite interesting. Now, I think you had some questions about hyperbarics and sleep yeah. as well. So can I bring you up here for just a second, Leonard? Thanks. You didn't know you were giving presentations. No, no. So I was in the hyperbaric chamber, and you put me in there. It was an awesome experience. And one of the things that we, and so we started talking about this idea of how can hyperbarics help with sleep? And I don't know the literature. You know some of the literature, but you certainly don't know all of that literature. I know more my experience in watching my patients go through hyperbarics. So with my patients, I've seen a lot of sleep apnea patients. A lot of patients are on CPAPs and don't sleep well. And when they start doing hyperbarics, when they've done probably between five and 10, and they start to get super oxygenated, they don't need their CPAP anymore. They start to sleep through the night on their own. They're so super oxygenated. And you know, when they come in the chamber, if they take a nap, they'll say it's the best, most restorative sleep they've had for that hour they were in the chamber ever, because they're so super oxygenated, there's no way to be active. There's no way to not have enough oxygen. So it's really an interesting idea. I don't, I'm not aware of a whole lot of literature that's on this. We're gonna be doing some studies and literature to try to understand more about it. But I can tell you, I'm pretty convinced that I'm gonna be including hyperbarics in the process for people. So they'll probably do a sleep screen, we'll then have them do a series of hyperbarics and see, get their supplements straight, and then we can see what we're working with. But that's kind of the ideas, but we'd also like to get feedback from you guys in terms of things that you think might be useful um, for you all or questions and things like that. So I wanted to open it up now. Thank you, you don't You're have welcome. to stand up here Thank the whole you. time. But she can answer <laughs> questions if you need her to. Um, but I figured I'd open it up now for questions and just see what people were thinking and wanted to know. 
um, other than what bed should I buy? That is almost always the first one. So um, this is a really interesting phenomenon, and it appears to change depending upon the patient. So, as it, so first of all, if I have a male patient that's waking up in the middle of the night, the first thing I'm going to be asking about is prostate and making sure that you have to pee, what's going on there, like let's figure that out. That's not my bailiwick, somebody else can deal with that. Let's say that's not the issue. So then the second thing that I look at is, and this is going to sound strange, but I found this to be quite effective, blood sugar. So one of the things that's really interesting is when you talk to people who wake up at 2.30 in the morning and you say, when was your last meal? They usually say it's like 6, 6.30. You start to look at the time frame, you think you're out of fuel. Like you're talking about seven, eight, nine hours oftentimes that people are waking up trying to figure out what's going on. What I think is happening is you're having a drop in your blood sugar which spikes your cortisol and makes you wake up to forage for food. Right? And so there's some interesting things that could be done. I've found two things in particular that have been very effective, but about 30-35% effective. One is something called guava leaf tea. There's actually a study on it um, that helps keep uh, blood sugar stable. And believe it or not, raw honey. So a teaspoon of raw honey. You can't do it if you're diabetic. You can't do it if you're keto or paleo or those kind of things. But sometimes that's been helpful as well. It has to be raw. It can't be like the honey from the bear. Right? It has to have the honeycomb in it because it takes longer for people to process that. The third area. Uh, so you have it when you wake up. Or you have it you prior to bed. So you kind of stack yourself, if you will. Again, honey's not my favorite thing to use. It's not terrible, but it's not my favorite thing. The guava leaf tea actually, I think, works like it. It's got a little bit of medicinal taste to it, but it actually works quite well. Um, the other thing that you start to look at, I guess, in that whole arena with the, with the guava leaf tea in the way, is uh, menopause and night sweats. Right? So that's a biggie, biggie, biggie. Um, and that, there, that's a whole pathway that people can go down, whether or not you're interested in you know, hormone replacement therapy, whether you're not, like, what do you want to do about that? I've got an extensive, um, blog, I've got seven 2,000 word blogs, about 14,000 words on sleep and menopause that I can, that I would be providing. But the bottom line is you try to keep the temperature as cool as you can, and you try to keep as cool as you can to avoid the night sweats. And there's, there is some literature on that, and that can, that can sometimes be helpful as well. The fourth area, I know I'm going a lot of areas, but it, it's a common problem with a lot of different possibilities. Um, is you went to bed at the wrong time. Right? So lots of people are going to bed not based on their chronotype. And so I've got a lot of people who are like, I just wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, I can't figure out why. So some of it is because you're an early bird chronotype, and some of it is because um, as you get older, your circadian rhythm begins to shift. So you ever notice in teenagers, what do teenagers want to do? They want to stay up late, and they want to sleep late. right? But as we get older, we want to do the opposite. <laughs> we want to go to bed early and wake up early. That's because our circadian clock has shifted. So sometimes I have those problems with people as well. And then quite frankly, some people are just stressed out. They wake up and they think, well, I'm up, I might as well go to the bathroom. And then they're really screwed, and I'll tell you why. Because when you go from a recumbent position to a seating position to a standing position, your heart rate isn't 60. I'll tell you that. Remember, 60 to get in, right? And so now you go to the bathroom, and you're moving all your parts, right? Heart rate's moving up. And then you go to the bathroom. What do you do to go to the bathroom? Well, you gotta find the toilet, so you flip the light on. Well, you just told your brain it was morning. Right, now you do your business, you go to do what you need to do. Now you come back, what's the first thing that you do? Look at the clock. Right? Unless you looked at the clock right when you woke up. How many people wake up in the middle of the night, what's the first thing you do? Look at the clock, raise your hands. Yeah, see, that's bad. Don't do that. Right, because what, what do you do when you look at the clock? Exactly. Oh, that stinks, I can't believe I gotta do that. Oh, I don't wanna do that, right? And so guess what you just did? All this autonomic arousal. And it's joined you in the middle of the night. You gotta get that heart rate below 60. So one of the things I teach clients is to flip the script. So in the middle of the night, when you look at the clock, you instantly do the mental math, right? It's 3.30, I gotta be up at 6.15, I've only got this much sleep left. Sleep, 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 and you try really hard to sleep. What I say, sleep's a lot like love. Unless you look for it, more shows up. If you try to sleep, it does not work. So change the idea. Wow, so I gotta get up at 6.30, and it's 3.30 now. This is awesome. I get three more hours to get a good night's sleep. And you know what, if I don't fall asleep, that's okay, because I'm gonna sit here, I'm gonna chill out, and I'm gonna relax. And one of the things that's really interesting is you start to look at the data, quiet relaxation, if you do that for an hour, it's worth about 20 minutes of sleep from a restorative standpoint. So once patients know that, they're like, oh, well, I'm getting something, so I might as well chill out. And guess what happens? They relax. They fall back asleep. 
right? So there's lots of different ways to kind of assess that and try to figure those things out. That's a great question. Other questions? I can't only have one question. There we go. I have three. Fire away. <laughs> one is sleep important for weight loss. So let's stop there. I want you to do one at a time. So I actually wrote an entire book called The Sleep Doctor's Diet, How to Lose Weight Through Better Sleep. So the answer is yes. Number two, could you explain what happens in our brains when we take meds like Ambien and Neostat? Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about medications. And I want to, I'm going to do a brief thing about weight loss and sleep really quickly. So what happens when you are sleep deprived is there's three situations that happen hormonally that will make you gain weight. Number one is your metabolism begins to slow down, and something called leptin, I'm sorry, something called ghrelin increases, and something called leptin decreases. It actually makes you feel comfortable, right? That's not too good for you. So now let's get back to Ambien. So when we talk about uh, prescription medications, things like Ambien, we call them the Z drugs, because it's Zolpidem and Zot, there's a thousand Z names. So when we look at the drugs, there's, um, you know, there's Ambien, there's Sonata, there's Lunesta, there's all of these different medications. So I'm gonna be very clear I am not a fan of pharmaceutical sleep. Just straight up, it's not my thing. To, to be even more clear, I would argue that there are many people who should be on pharmaceutically induced sleep, right? So if there are, when I've got a patient who's, who's uh, bipolar and they haven't taken their meds and they're in a manic episode, there's nothing that's going to get them to sleep but a medication. Right? When you're talking about severe mental health issues, we're talking about severe pain, we're talking about, like in my pain patients that I, when I was working with Mike Wolf, we, our starting dose of Ambien was 20 milligrams. That was our starting dose. That's 10 milligrams over the regular dose, right? But pain patients are a whole new kit and caboodle. These, I mean, they eat meds for lunch. So when you're talking about these different things, there's a lot to think about. I would argue nobody's got a broken sleeper. You know that switch in your head that makes you fall asleep? I don't think anybody's one is broken. I, I, gotta, I don't think people need drugs to sleep most of the time. So I'm not the biggest fan. I'd rather make sure that your magnesium is good, your vitamin D is good, your iron is good, make sure the body is functioning appropriately. Then we look at scheduling, then we look at your genetics. We'll find it. I don't think you have to have pharmaceutical. I do like pharmaceuticals to break the cycle of insomnia, right? Because a lot of people get really in that dishwasher thing. I mean, I got some patients calling me up, like, I'm getting two hours a night. Okay, well, let's, let's have a pharmaceutical intervention to stop that. Let's have it last for two to three months so that we can get you on a regular sleep cycle. And let's teach you how to sleep and then slowly take it off. That's the appropriate way to use Third question. Weighted blankets. So weighted blankets are really interesting. So <laughs> this is going to sound super bizarre. So weighted blankets actually come from the slaughterhouse industry. <laughs> So if you, are, if you know anything about slaughterhouses, when they bring the animals in, they know what's about to happen. And so they would put these heavy weighted blankets on top of them, and it would calm the animals down. They took that idea and they brought it into the autistic community, and they started using it with autistic children. And what, guess what they discovered? At certain weights, when you wrap this child, they started to calm down. It's a very interesting area of study. Now they've moved it over to just general anxiety, and that's where this whole weighted blanket craze has come from. I mean, Walmart, you can buy a weighted blanket at this point. So do they have utility? I think they do for some people, especially people who are maybe on the spectrum or you think might have some of those spectrum issues. I think that could be good. A couple of cautionary tales about weighted blankets. So I've seen them as low as 10 pounds and as high as 25 pounds. To be clear, nobody should have a 25 pound blanket on their body. Right? That's just too much weight. I recommend a 12 pound weighted blanket. If you look at the data, that makes a lot of sense. But you also need to be careful if you have small dogs or children, babies, if they get underneath, they can suffocate. So if you have a weighted blanket, fold it up after you use it, put it in your closet when you're done. Um, I can say that maybe 30% of the patients that I uh, tried them on, it's been effective. Sure, other questions? Yeah. What does it mean when you plan out your next day while you're sleeping? <laughs> During the dream or before you fall asleep? When you're sleeping, you wake up in the morning and say like you already lived it. You've already worked out your whole day. So for some people, that that so for some people what we see is that as you're falling asleep, you're thinking about what's going to be happening the next day. And then remember, Dreams are processing information. And so what's probably happened is you've started to process some of that information. And then when you wake up, you're kind of ready to rock. Well, I, already know what, I, already, I know what I got to do. Right. It's perfect. Honestly, dude, I wish I woke up it's, that way every day. It's, it's, it's make my life so much easier. Right. I know. Write a list. 
So, so Lauren brings up a point, which is a really good one too, which is a gratitude list. So a lot of people don't know what these are, but these are very positive things that you can do before bed. So there's now data to show that optimism before bed not only helps you fall asleep, but you have more positive dreams. Just take off in your head a couple of things that you're grateful for. You might be surprised at how effective it is for your sleep. Now, I know we weren't talking about a gratitude list. You were talking about writing things down before bed. So I also do that as well. So sometimes I'll keep a pad and pen by my bed. I don't know about you guys, but like, I'm pretty sure I can solve every single business problem I've ever had within the three minutes before I'm falling asleep, right? I mean, I'm thinking about my business, and it's like, and then you think about it, you think about it, you think about it, right? Put a pad by the side of your bed. Write down a couple of notes, get it out of your head. You'd be surprised that the notes weren't very good. I've never cured cancer, I've never saved my business, I've never done anything with the ideas that I have as I'm falling asleep. Uh, gratitude list will probably get you a lot further. Other questions? Yeah? Caffeine, how many hours before sleep is allowed? Does it affect, like alcohol affects stage 3 and 4? Does yeah. caffeine affect the way you sleep? So caffeine in and of itself is a pretty interesting molecule when you start to look at it. The half-life, generally speaking, of caffeine is between six and eight hours, depending on how quick of a metabolizer you are. There's also new data to show that some people are more caffeine sensitive than others. I had one patient, if she ate a chocolate kiss, she'd be up all night. I had another patient who could drink a pot of coffee and fall right to sleep. Now, here's to be clear for people out there that are like, huh, not supposed to drink, because I tell people stop drinking caffeine at 2 p.m. Right? So I say 2 p.m. is the cutoff because if it's an eight hour, right, that leaves you at 10, which is roughly the time that most people go to bed, kind of makes sense to me, right? Like, oh, Dr. Bruce, you're crazy. I can have a cup of coffee and dinner and I'll be just fine. You might fall asleep, but if I stuck electrodes on your head and I looked at the quality of the sleep that you're getting, it's total crap. Okay? Caffeine is a stimulant. It directly affects stage three, four sleep. It actually pushes it out. So what you, obliterates it. So what ends up happening is when you have lots of caffeine before bed, you don't get into those deeper stages of sleep, so you don't wake up feeling rested. The same holds true with alcohol, by the way. The closer you drink alcohol to bedtime, that completely obliterates stage three, stage three four sleep as well. Now, one of the things that you reminded me of that I forgot to tell everybody is my favorite sleep hack. I call it the Napa Latte. All right, so here's what you do. If you only got four hours of sleep the other night and you are dying, but you really need to have some energy, get a cup of black drip of coffee, six ounce cup of coffee, throw three ice cubes in just to cool it down. Drink it as quickly as you can and close your eyes and take a 25 minute nap. So remember when I was telling you about the molecules, caffeine versus adenosine before? So when you're sleeping for 25 minutes, you burn through the adenosine, caffeine's waiting in the wings, you're good for four hours, guaranteed. All of my CEOs use this technique. Please don't do a Napa latte every day. <laughs> that would be bad, but it's a technique that works really, really well. What about heart rate? You can't be under 60 with a chug of coffee. So what's fascinating is, is that doesn't seem to kick in. People are, and also it depends on timing. I get a lot of people to nap somewhere between one and three in the afternoon, where we have a natural core body temperature drop and a small melatonin spike, so it works out really well. It's surprising. Honestly, when I first start, started trying it myself and doing it with patients, I was like, there's no way this is gonna work. And, it works well. I was quite surprised. I keep thinking this mannequin behind you is asking a question because his arms are like, what's your question, dude? And I'm like, oh. I have a question, Dr. Yeah. Um, I notice a difference when I wake up from natural light as opposed to like sleep apnea. Like, how does that affect your sleep? Yeah, no, it's not in your head. I only wake up to it. So when we look at light, one thing that everybody has to remember is light is medicine, right? So light has a dramatic effect on the body in many different ways. Um, and we have a red bed in there to show that as a matter of fact. Um, but when we talk about light and we talk about awakening, it's always, been, like my favorite are those sunrise alarm clocks for people. Because it's just, it, even if it's artificial, it kind of gives you that slow, yeah. it definitely helps. We're like plants. I just feel like when you describe us, we sound like I mean, we are high maintenance plants. That is absolutely. We need water and, and sunshine, sunshine yeah. in the morning, and then we will be. And, and plants actually have a circadian cycle. If they you ever, do. if you look in the biology or botany of plants, you'll see that they open and close. They close. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yes, Victor. Uh, is there any way to beat that afternoon sleepiness, nap time? Yes. Other than caffeine, is there yes. Any, like, 
So remember, what, so what's going on there is, is it, it, so there's a bimodal distribution of the temperature. There's a small hitch between 1 and 3 in the afternoon where there's a small spike, and that releases melatonin. So the easiest thing to do is to walk outside at about 12.30 and get a dose of sunlight because it prevents the melatonin from being produced and then you don't have to sleep. Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? It's science. Questions? I think we're good. That was incredible. Thank you guys very much. Thank you.